The 18 Strong Podcast, episode number 356 with Marty Jertsen, Director of Product Development at Ping and co-founder of The Stack System. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the 18 Strong Podcast, where we're here to help you build a stronger game because we believe that everyone deserves to play better longer. This week, I'm super excited about our episode with the Director of Product Development at Ping, Marty Jertsen, who is also the co-founder of The Stack System with Dr. Sasho McKenzie. So in this episode, we're talking not only about the product development and everything that Ping does to make some of the greatest golf clubs on the planet. We talk about club fitting. We talk about data and how they use that data to develop different clubs to improve every single year. But then we talk about the stack system and building speed. You've probably heard of the stack system because of guys like Matthew Fitzpatrick and seeing the speed that he's gained and him winning the U.S. Open and that becoming a big talk of conversation with being able to gain speed even at the highest of levels. Well, the stack is one of the reasons behind that gain in speed. And there's over 30,000 golfers on the planet now using the stack system. So no matter what level you are, utilizing the stack system to gain speed, to gain distance, and really more control over your game. So we talk about that with Marty. We talk about his game. He's played in multiple PGA championships and PGA level tournaments. And this product was really designed because he noticed himself not being able to hang with the guys on the tour. And that's really where the story starts with the stack system. So you're really going to enjoy this episode and we'll get into it right after this. Our partners over at Linksoul have been providing us with the best apparel for both on the course and off the course from polos to t-shirts like the one I have on right now. Everything that they have is meant to be worn from the golf course to wherever you're going next, whether that be casual, whether that be to the beach, there's all different options over there. So go to 18strong.com slash Linksoul. You'll get 20% off of anything in your cart over on Linksoul's website. So again, 18strong.com slash Linksoul for our favorite brand of apparel for anything on the golf course and off. Now let's get to this week's interview. So Marty, we we're just kind of talking about the 2018, you know, PGA Championship here at Belle Reve. Um, I mean, obviously you have tons of stories there. Tell me, first of all, you, you were saying that the fans were so great. I love to brag on St. Louis. So it was one of the coolest sporting events I've been to. But what was your experience? Had you ever been to St. Louis before? And, you know, how was that, that event for you? No, actually, I think that in 2018 was my first time to St. Louis. I played some, I think, college tournaments in and around the area. I have a lot of you know, family from Kansas City, but it's a lot, it's a ways away, obviously. Um, they, but they came down and went to the event, which was really fun. But of all the PJs I've played in, I think the crowd was the most like electric there. Like I think because golf, you know, big golf doesn't come to St. Louis and right. in that area that often. And I think that's one of the reasons the PGA of America loved having it there at Bell Reef. And the crowd was electric and there were so many kids. I remember like, it's fun for me because I'm just a working guy, like normal guy, and like, oh, somebody wants your autograph. I, it was fun for me uh, being around some of our other pink tour players, like Fina and some of these guys, and so many kids there. This is so family oriented, so many kids there. The crowd was just super into the goal. Um, and so it was very refreshing. I had a great time. My uh, my nephew, he was there Tuesday. We were talking about how it you know rained a ton on Tuesday, but. Uh, Got kids were there, like you said, to go get autographs and get things yes. signed. He's they stuck around as long as they possibly could. He's got a flag with, I don't know how many different names on it, and he yeah. stuck around. And I think Kepka was like one of the last guys to come through, so he got Kepka's name on it. Ends up going I, on a win, and so, um, you know, he was he was super happy. But I mean, just the whole, like you said, the electricity of the event. Tiger Woods being there, obviously, from what I yeah. from what I heard, I wasn't there on Sunday, but they said that on Sunday. It was like hearing thunder, like just all the people running from yeah. one spot to another with with Tiger. And, and you made the cut that weekend. You played all four rounds that weekend. Could you could I mean, were you out there for any of that? Could you hear it? Could you feel it? So that actually is so I made the cut in 19, oh, 19. at okay. Beth Page. But this is part of the story because in 18, <laughs> this part of my story was in 18, I played. Uh, at Bell Reed, and I got paired with Luke List, and, he, and, and obviously he's been playing great lately, but he gets the ball so far. He was hitting it even further than 
and I was kind of like demoralized by my distance at 18. And it was, Bell Reef was kind of soft, so it was all carry. And distance m mattered a ton that week, as well as like your precision iron play. And so the next, I worked on some things to gain a lot of distance, and I requalified for the PGA Championship at Bethpage. This kind of relates to Tiger, because I did play all four rounds at Bethpage when I made the cut. And I was uh, two groups behind Tiger. So I, I teed off two groups behind Tiger. And anyone on tour is like, hey, you either want to be playing with Tiger or you want to be at least two groups away. Because if you're the group ahead or the group behind, the crowds are all coming in to get, get their spot. Or if you're in the group behind, everyone's like trailing away. So actually, it was perfect because I got to experience the Tiger roars because he actually he missed the cut at, at Bethpage. But he made an, e an eagle whenever he'd make a birdie. It was just uh, like electric, the roars. There's nothing like that. It was fun to actually be playing in the event uh, uh, in this close proximity when you know we experienced a little bit of that. That's, that's so amazing. How many PGA Championships have you played in? I've played in five PGA Championships and uh, one US Open, so six majors total. Okay, and um, now are you a, a PGA professional, PGA instructor, or? Is that how did you get into the PJ Championship? Yeah, so uh, yes, I am. A, I'm in kind of a. I think my whole job and career is kind of like a, a mystery. Sometimes I even have a hard time describing it. Uh, but yes, I am a PJ of America member. So I think most PJ of America members, the most common is you work at a golf course, head pro, THG pro, assistant pro, GM, that type of thing. But you can be a PJ member and work in other avenues. Like I think, you know, Mike Small, the golf coach at Illinois, he's, he's a PJ member and you're allowed to be a golf coach. So you got to kind of be employed anywhere in the industry. So, you know, I, uh, in my role at Ping, I'm able to be a PJ member through one of the classifications there. And then obviously now, also have a speed training aid company, uh, the stack system. So both of those kind of qualify to be a working professional golfer. Um, and it's kind of like getting your masters in the golf industry. Actually, the, the education process to become a PGA member is pretty rigorous. It takes most folks, you know, three to five years to kind of go through the whole book work, education, certification process. Now, so let's go back to kind of your history because you, you went to – uh, engineering school, mechanical yeah. engineering degree, Colorado School of Minor is it Miners or Mines? Mines, mines. Colorado School of Mines. Okay. Yep. It, very. In, I, I I heard you talk about this on the show with uh, with your buddy Sleaz and Colt, um, and <laughs> and kind of dove deep into your past. But give us a little background on you know what took you to engineering school, what then got you into you know going on to the golf path and actually getting into having a career in the world of golf. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, with a lot of uh, kind of folks that do interesting things, like there, there's there's luck along the way, you know, and knowing that, you know, meeting the right person at the right time or one little micro decision that sends you uh, down a path. And so I, I think my journey is very much like that. Like I, I was a pretty good junior golfer, but not great, right? And, and so it's always kind of this, you know, on the fringe of, oh, man, I should go try to play for a big D1 school and commit to golf. And I, and I think in the back of my head, I was like, yeah, I'm just not as good as some of these other kids that are kicking my butt in all the junior tournaments. So I had to make that decision. Should I go try to play for a D1 team and not do engineering because the coaches won't let you? It's just not allowed. I don't know what it's like now. Or should I go to you know, a better academic school where I could still play golf, but make golf the number two priority. And that's what I chose to do, uh, Colorado School of Mines. Now their academic program's amazing. They have the number one football team D2 right now, and the wow. golf program is phenomenal. So I was kind of at the beginning of that, ramping the golf team up from, you know, kind of like a hobby golf team to now we're a legitimate team that's, uh, if, if, if you're in, want to do math, science, engineering, and, and you also want to play golf, it'd be an awesome place to look at. So that's kind of how I ended up there. And I grew up in a small mining town, copper mining town. And so a lot of the, um, you know, kind of folks that ran the mines in my town were alumni from the Colorado School of Mines. So that's how I, that's how I knew about the school and had a great time up there playing D2 golf and and spent the summers in Colorado, and, and uh, that kind of shaped my future of, uh, you know, getting a little bit better at golf through college. Uh, and uh, But then I kind of graduated from school, and I was faced with decisions like, do I do my engineering degree 
or do I play professional golf? And I, I gave pro golf, uh, you know, uh, a run for about a year. Um, and you know, I think I realized that the math just is not on your side as a mini tour golfer. <laughs> yeah, okay. I realized not faster than a lot of my friends. Um, and then kind of got the door bang and uh, been doing my thing here ever since. What did you start? What was your first role at Ping? Yeah, it was kind of like a, sort of like an intern, so to speak, even though I'd already graduated and I helped set up, um, you know, Ping is very committed to making product in American manufacturing, super fun. We have about 800 employees here at our campus and a majority of those, the, the, the biggest chunk of those is manufacturing jobs. They're building the golf clubs that you're hitting. And so we have, you know, 350, 400 employees that are doing that assembly work. The loft and lie, the gripping, the epoxy, the custom weighting, all that stuff. So my first job was working on the assembly line, doing manufacturing engineering, what's called lean manufacturing, taking some things from like the Toyota way and how Toyota builds product in, Jap in Japan and bringing some of those lean manufacturing techniques that allows us, the end goal is we can build, build a driver uh, that goes into our manufacturing line and exits it about 30 minutes later. It's literally drawing while it's in transit out to the customer. So Whoa. where before that it took like, you know, days to build one driver. And then did you soon thereafter get into the designing portion of the clubs or is that something that you kind of have to work your way into? And is that something that you were really excited about doing or you're just kind of like, ah, I'm at ping, we'll see what happens and go from there. Yeah, I, I think the design part was super intimidating to me. Like, it was like, how is this done? I, I had a little bit of what's called CAD or 3D design experience, but that seemed very daunting to me to learn a new skill. It was scary. Like, I didn't know if I had the belief in myself that I could actually do that one day, right? I was kind of interested in it, but I've, I've always kind of, uh, I think like a lot of folks out there, like questioning, like, can I do that? Um, and so, yeah, I, I was brought in and it's very much when you do it, when you become a product designer in our culture, we kind of have a, like to have an apprenticeship model because there's the learning curve is so steep and you cannot learn this in school. Like, I think that's one of the big conclusions. You get, you go to school to learn baseline things, foundational things, but every, but when you get out of school, the real learning starts, right? I think that's, totally. um, you know, a, a, a big thing I've learned over the years. So it was a it was very daunting to learn that. And I had I had some great mentors that taught me the ropes of the foundational pieces, the design product, and then a really big learning curve to get good at the 3D design. And I spent a lot of time where my brain was thinking and seeing every little object I saw. How would I create that in 3D? <laughs> and so there was a, there was quite a few years of my life uh, behind the computer doing a lot of 3D work and, and trying to really get good at the CAD side. And you have to marry that with the with the physics side. There's tons of golf physics that goes into it. So yeah, I kind of I kind of apprenticed into that design role and started to slowly take on more and more projects and gain confidence because I didn't really I kind of struggled with that at the beginning. That you know kind of had a lot of that self doubt. And then my confidence got higher and I started to become more interested in things beyond club head design, shafts, grips, uh, friction, span wedges, putters, club fitting. Um, and, and that's kind of been the basis of, I think, um, you know, how my career has evolved over, you know, now 20 years doing it. What was the first club that you had a piece of like from start to finish? Yeah. The first one where I was like the, you know, that, 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 that was a, Exciting time, but a high pressure time is when you get your first official project and you are literally the chief engineer. Like you're, you're in charge of everything. Uh, the graphics, how it looks, the manufacturing, kind of, uh, you know, cost optimization side of things, durability testing, player testing, performance testing. The first one I owned was the Rapture Hybrid. Really cool, it kind of paired with our, for, for the golf enthusiasts out there, uh, historians, our Rapture driver, which had composite in it, was our first driver that had composite in it back there in the, in, in around like 2005, six time frame. And so I designed, it was the early days of hybrids. So, you know, there wasn't like a rule, there wasn't a playbook to follow. You had to kind of pioneer what the shape should be, how it should spin, the lofts and materials. Um, and I designed this really cool uh, multi-material construction, tungsten sole plate, 
high strength face all welded together you could loft and lie them and this type of thing and it was it was it was super fun seeing that club out in retail in the golf shops for the first time i'll never for, forget um you know working on that one when you're you know there's so many things I would assume that you can put into a club. You're talking about the different metals and, and ways to, to piece these things together. And I mean, the chemistry of it. I mean, I don't even know where to begin asking how, how you start to come up with different, different ideas yeah. of how do we make yeah. these clubs better? I mean, obviously year after year, after year, after year, you guys are coming up with new technology, different ways to, to make yeah. a club better. But then also I'm assuming there's, quite a few regulations you have to stay within and you know you have to be um attentive to you know what are the rules what's usga approved or what you know how do you first even kind of start looking at okay here's what we have right now like your current clubs right now is it something that you guys are thinking about all right now how do we what are we going to do next is it is it that simple like just starting with that question and then or is it gradually kind of improving on what's already out there uh, uh, th th that's just a great framework. And I think the, the, the questions that you asked are not a lot of like cons golf consumers think about like, what are we doing? What are we doing yeah. be over here? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> How do we approach the totally. problem, you know? Um, and uh, uh, I think Ping is, is a very fun place to work and our team is super talented and we have a great uh, kind of core mission, which is don't get too hyper focused on the, the the technology side. Stay very focused on defining the problem that the golfer is facing. What is the pain point, right? And so instead of sitting down saying, "Hey, we need to implement this technology," we at first sit down and say, "What problem are we trying to solve? What is the pain point for the golfer?" Like, and, and some of them can be very simple. Like, we need more ball speed, right? For the driver to go further, we need more ball speed. Do we need this driver to spin more or spin less? Do we need it to be more forgiving? What is, then we go into what is the technical definition of forgiveness? Like what is forgiveness? Oh, we need the ball speed to higher uh, in all portions around the face. We need impacts low on the face to be more similar in distance as hits high on the face. And then we say, well, how can we do that? Okay, well, we can make the moment of inertia higher or we can change the face curvature. What levers do we have to pull on and so we start we'll always start at the problem for the golfer and work back towards what is the technology that we can use to solve those problems. And Ping's been super committed to that. And I think it's really paid off to help our brand be such a good long-term brand that some years we're bringing enormous innovations to the market like turbulators. Uh, and you talked about, Jeff, one, one question is, I think a lot of people are thinking the exact same thing as you are. Is, oh, they're all regulated. Right. I'm like, well, one of the ways to force an engineer to be creative is to put a wall in front of them because you, you, you're you forced into creativity. Engineers and designers a lot of times struggle if things are too open ended, like it, like if you have no rules or no regulations, sometimes that would be harder than knowing you got to play within this box. I can kind of sneak around over here, sneak a little performance over here. Turbulators are a perfect ex example of that. There's no ESGA regulation on how aerodynamically efficient you can make a driver, right? There's no, now they do have regulations on features and where you can put features and the size and shape. So I think that's a great example of cracking the code on having a driver that's very big, but it's aerodynamic, it's drag coefficient is like we have a driver that's super small, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a way that that's one example where we can kind of have an innovation that's not even in the spot of being regulated. Um, and, and then we have some really strong patents on that and we can protect it, things of that nature. So the turbulator, what what exactly is a, a turbulator? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> You've mentioned it a couple times. I'm like, <laughs> it, it is what it sounds like it is. It turbulates yeah. there. No, I'm just kidding. So it's a, it's these tiny little, well, not they're, they're not tiny. They're, um, the size and shape of them uh, are very exact, uh, but they're little ridges right on the crown of the driver. So that's where the face meets the top of the driver. Mm -hmm. There's these ridges, and on our driver we have six of them. Yep. Okay. And what they do is they 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 create a micro layer of turbulence uh, that takes the airflow. You know, we have some really cool videos of this we've done in the wing tunnel. 
So you have air uh, flow going over the top of the, the meat in the face and joining the crown. It's very blunt. It'd be like a pickup truck or something. It's to make a driver uh, go be very forgiving. It's naturally not very aerodynamic. And so what these ridges do is they give the airflow more momentum to stay attached to the crown because normally you get this vacuum effect. You get a low pressure area that creates like a, you can think of it like a vacuum, like sucking the driver backwards, the wrong direction, mm -hmm. getting a net force on the driver going the wrong direction. And, and that's what normally happens if you don't have turbulators. It's like a pickup truck, huge weight back there, sucking the, ruining the uh, gas mileage of the pickup truck. So what turbulators do, they keep that airflow more attached to the crown, give the air momentum, and it reduces the drag coefficient significantly. Um, so super cool. We developed that using Flow CFD software, which is like a virtual wind tunnel. And we did a lot of little experiments, getting the size, shape, spacing, contouring. Uh, we're doing some uh, wind tunnel testing down here at Arizona State University. I mean, you guys probably just have the coolest toys to play with <laughs> ever, I would imagine. Yeah, we got some good kids. Like, uh, we have a really cool markerless motion capture system, which is kind of... Uh, Measures the twisting, uh, drooping, lead lagging, how the shaft bends, basically. Um, and we do that at like uh, 700, 800 frames a second. It's kind of got like a live MRI of your golf swing. Oh and that's gosh. one of our fa favorite research pieces of kit that we have here. That's so awesome. You mentioned that you guys always work from the problem back. What are what are some of the, the top problems that you guys are constantly trying to solve? I'm going to guess distance, accuracy, and, you know, which one do you guys tend to do you lean towards one or the other or is it you know working on a little bit of everything there's been a, a big kind of money ball revolution in golf and it kind of goes down to the, the the core of it was um like a new statistics that showed up in golf uh called strokes game and this was originated by kind of the godfather of golf statistics named mark mark brody um, and his son chris brody works with me and for me here as my colleague you know solving problems here so we're very very tied to that. And I bring that up because it's helped given a really good framework on what our priorities are. Should we focus more on distance? Should we focus more on accuracy? And the other cool piece that we have access to now is a lot of on course data. So I think that's one of the coolest things is that people evaluated golf equipment through a custom fitting. And then you go play golf and it's kind of like, okay, good luck. We'll never see you again or see you when you need new clubs in three to five years. Those things are kind of gone. Now we can, through things like Arcos, which is, um, you know, stats, smart stats tracking, uh, GPS integrated. We know what clubs you're hitting, where on the golf course, where you might be better or worse. We can start bringing that on course big data into our design and fitting environment. And it's super exciting times. I, you know, quite frankly, I think we're just scratching the surface on that front. Um, and that's helping us drive those priorities. Where on the golf course can we help golfers play better golf? So that's exposing some things like your club gapping. That's the spacing, the yardage spacing mm -hmm. you have between all your clubs. We're doing some really fun things that are driven by on-course data, you know, on-course play. So I think, you know, of course we want the driver to go super far. We also wanted to go straight. We're using really cool analytics to give us that ratio of how much further versus straighter. And we actually have that boiled down to like a you know, actual simple ratio. Uh, you you know, if your everyday player should be hitting it further in a ratio of two to one as compared to their straightness from a from a statistical standpoint, stroke being standpoint. Uh, and then, you know, we want the clubs to sound good. We want them to feel good. And then we're, we're using on-course play data to help prioritize gapping and things of that nature. I didn't realize that you guys had, and I, I should have realized this, that you had access to all of that on-course stuff from things like Arcos. And that's amazing to me that, and just, I mean, goes to show how much is involved in the research that you guys are doing and really trying to figure out what are the, the different gaps. Where do people like me versus, you know, super low handicappers, you know, guys like you, professionals, um, when you guys are, I mean, obviously you have such a wide array of products for different levels of golfers. Is there one, um, you know, handicap level or, or grouping of handicap levels that makes up the biggest demographic? And does that drive a lot of, of what you're doing? 
Yeah, for sure. And that's a great question, Jeff, is that uh, Ping was founded by, you know, a frustrated, really good, smart, frustrated engineer, Garson Solheim. And so he he kind of solved the, the, the problem for himself, which was like he was he was like a, you know, high handicap golfer that wanted to get better and the game seemed too hard. And he wanted to bring better engineering through the equipment. So we ask ourselves that question a lot. If if we could only have one model of product for the entire market, what would it be? And by far, that's like our G series product, like our G430, uh, you know, max driver in our G430 irons. By far, that's kind of like our modern day I2. And for those that golf historians out there that know the I2 iron, which was the m number one iron for like a decade in the golf marketplace. Our G430 is that iron that if we only made one, it would work amazing for everybody. And But the peak of the market is your high handicap golfer, right? Your weekend warrior. Uh, they're trying to get a little bit better when they can, but they got families, they got jobs, but they get out there on the weekends and they want something that's gonna have plenty of forgiveness, go relatively far, go relatively high. And that's what our G series product does. What would you say to, because I think that demographic is a lot of the people listening to the show. We've got, you know, yeah. instructors and medical professionals in, listening too, but I, I like to think that our main demographic listening is obviously the, the fitness minded golfer, many of them probably in like the 35 plus range and varying in, in all ranges of handicaps. Um, but what are some of the things that you would suggest to, to that crew regarding what's what's most important when you're looking at new clubs um i know i've heard you talk about club fitting and and how important that yeah. can be what are some of the recommendations just simple low-hanging fruit things that you would tell these people yeah uh great question number one is um don't be intimidated to go get a club fitting right and be open-minded be open-minded um we've built some great tools if you find a good pin club fitter out there we have some amazing fitting tools to get you dialed so you can have your mind be open that you can gain distance or performance through the club designs and equally as much, this is like a Venn diagram, you want to gain performance through the fitting. And you need to marry those two together. You want to have them both, have, have both the fitting and the, the product engineering benefiting you. Okay, so the fitting is super important, equally as important as the product. Uh, so be very open-minded to try some things like you might have a super fast club head speed but you might be better because your transition or how you need to launch the ball in a little bit of a softer shaft you know so kind of maybe drop your ego a little bit uh then you you might have tried in the past right so that might be something to think about um but definitely get get a, get a club fitting on a launch monitor that's super important and be mindful of not only your one best shot that might happen you want to look at how consistent they are you want to look at your how good are your miss hits. Golf is very much a game that you want to kind of control your misses and you want your misses to be better. So that's one, I think, valuable piece of advice when you go into that fitting environment is yes, look at your good shots. You want to hit your good shots great, but also look at the shots that you don't hit as good. And that's where you can really differentiate from better product in that the engineering of the design is as good as your miss hits. I like that you say don't don't focus on one shot that you hit perfect because I feel like that's typically how we think in our head. Like, oh, my seven Absolutely. iron goes one one sixty five. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, because I did it one time and I probably sculled it. Um, so, club head versus shaft. I know that you know. I've heard so many times, you know, the shaft is super important. What are some of the things yeah. about the shaft? And, and I heard you talk about this in, in the episode on the subpart talking about, and you even just mentioned it, about the transition and how that plays yes. a big deal in, in what shaft is right for you. Um, but club head versus shaft is one more important than the other, or does it just kind of depend? And, and that's where the fitting really makes the biggest difference. Yeah. So uh, you're going to control most of the performance through the properties of the head. For example, uh, you know, I can't give you an L flex shaft and an X flex shaft, and that will not change how the ball flies as much as me giving you like a nine degree driver versus a 12 degree driver. So the head is the most important from a launch condition and a performance standpoint, but that's not saying the shaft is not important. The shaft is really a fitting 
lever. So again, it's um, you want to marry them both together. And what the shaft can do for you is you want it to kind of match your 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 kinetics. It's how you apply force to the club, right? This is like your signature. How you apply force and torque. And you mentioned, Jeff, uh, like your transition. So the transition is super important because that's where you change the direction at the top of your backswing and how you apply force and torque to the handle through your hands. There's a lot of biomechanics that goes into why everyone does that a little bit differently, but that is the secret sauce of, of shaft fitting is fitting you to the right shaft for A, your club at speed, B, whether you need to hit a little higher or lower, but the most important thing is that you kind of fall in love with how that shaft is going to behave, bend and deflect, with how you, individual golfer, apply force and torque through the hands to the handle during the transition. And so a tons of our research goes into how do we build better tools and make that very easy, because that sounds hard and mysterious and overwhelming and intimidating, <laughs> but we have tools to help our fitters do that and get you into the right shaft. So you have two players that both swing the club at uh, the same speed at the bottom, but they're gonna need totally different shafts based on how they transition it. One might apply a force like more straight along the shaft during the downswing, and one might pull down on the handle and deflect it more. And you wanna marry how much, what you do there in transition to the stiffness of the shaft. Can you give us an example of two guys on tour that you know, you know, like two different style swings or two different transitions that maybe give us a better visual of, and maybe what, you know, if you happen to know what they're using. Yeah, totally. So like a smooth transition would be if anyone out there could picture Louis Oosthuizen, like sweet swinging, silky looking Louis God, I want that swing. <laughs> oh, it looks so good. And he has what we call a smooth transition. So, and this is a really fun story. He's typically used, even though he swings at like 100, you know, he's swinging at 118 club hit speed, he has used very soft shafts. He's even used a, a shaft out there called the auto flex for a while, which is basically like a lady's flex in terms of the bending stiffness. Well, and, and he kind of experimented that with a little, for a little while, but he's typically used the equivalent of an S flex or stiff flex shaft, even though you know, if you go off some some fitting algorithm, it might be, oh, he needs a triple X based on his, his swing speed. So he's one, if you can visualize him, where the, the club and the shaft go in and then they return closer to the same trajectory. Mm -hmm. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you guys can kind of visualize, uh, well, a, a Victor Hovland's the modern day example, or Cameron Champ, both very high club and speed. Cameron Champ's off the charts. He's in the, you know, the top of the PGA Tour for club and speed but they have what we call a very abrupt transition where in that change of direction, they're pulling down on the handle a lot and that that creates a lot of deflection in the shaft. So for those players, we need a shaft that's gonna minimize or optimize that deflection. And that's generally a shaft that's much, much stiffer in the butt section. Uh, and so if, if you give those guys uh, if you swap Louis Schaff with Victor Hovland, they got the same club head speed, both of them would go crazy and have erratic results because we're not marrying up their kinetics in that transition. And that just goes to reiterate the, the importance of going and having somebody look at your swing, somebody that understands it, have the track man be able to, to tell the different you know scenarios, look at the different numbers and, and fit you for the proper one, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You are, you are. The shaft is all about fitting. It's all about matching it to you individually. Yeah, absolutely. I want to take just a second to thank our new partner, which I'm really excited to announce is First Form. First Form is a company that is here in St. Louis, based in St. Louis. It's a nutritional company that is doing incredible things in the world of nutrition. And one of the reasons that we decided to partner with First Form is obviously we're very impressed with their dedication to their products and the quality of their products. But really it's the dedication to them and them helping their customers get real results. Aside from just the products, we got a chance to go and actually visit the facility, again, here in St. Louis, 
and really walk the halls of the corporate offices, but we got to see the manufacturing plant or the, the warehouse. And it's not just a, a place where they're packaging supplements and shipping them out. It's a culture, it's a community, and you can see that amongst the employees. You can see that their culture and their core values that are not just pieces of art on their wall, they're actually letting them there and they're helping to expand those into the community. And really that's why we partner with First Form. Obviously their products are incredible, otherwise we wouldn't suggest them either. We use them on a regular basis. So you're gonna be hearing a lot more about their products and what they can do for your fitness, what they can do for your golf game, the protein powders, the multivitamins, the protein sticks, the hydration packets, all of those products we're gonna highlight in future episodes. But we just wanted to really celebrate our new partnership with First Form. You can go to their website, firstform.com forward slash 18 strong. And we're gonna be doing a giveaway every single month with anybody that buys through that link. So go to firstform.com, that's P H O R M dot com forward slash 18 strong that'll take you directly to their website and you can check their whole suite of products it's including some of their fitness apparel and anything that's purchased over there you're going to be enrolled into our list for our giveaway so we talked a little bit about your experience from 2018 to 19 the you know seeing these guys just bomb bomb balls uh, <laughs> it was really wet out there um it's my understanding is that kind of where some of the you went and worked on your speed a whole lot um is that where the idea of the the stack started to percolate a little bit and how did you and sasha mckenzie who was your partner and and co-founder in the stack system how did you guys uh even start to work on collaborating together and and give us the story of of that yeah i think my whole uh, kind of career has been trying to create products um and in this i think there's a good about this is like i think an advice i've read or heard about is you, you want to try to solve your own problem and then, and then if you can do that you have like maximum skin in the game and then um and then try to scale it and help others right you know and i think and i've tried to create i've almost created like a you know whole ecosystem around that because i i i golf is such a painful sport it's so hard you go out there, it's so rare to win. Like almost every time you quote unquote lose, you finish second or or or, uh, or, or worse than that. Um, it's such a painful sport. So yes, in 2018, when I played with Luke Liss, when I was in St. Louis, that was the tipping point for me where I was like, I that was my, I think, third PJ championship. And I was like, it, I could definitely get in another one of these. Like I could qualify again through the through uh the pga national championship and all those things my skill was good in a lot of areas but by far i was at that point where i was hitting it way too short to compete at that level and my I, my like life's dream by my my grown-up dream was to make the cut in major like i was like man i want to play the weekend in one of these things i don't want to just come up come over here be the club pro not play the weekend and off you go and pack your bags and kind of is what it's going to be and everyone kind of counts on that i want to i want to defy the odds here and play the weekend it was fun to watch michael Blanc do that this oh, year yeah. by the way it was super fun watching him and, and i've talked to him a few times about it um so yeah now that, that's when the whole i guess the pain of getting it like how do i solve getting it further and so sasha dr sasha mckenzie who's probably golf's leading biomechanist uh he's been a consultant for us at ping with research research on things like shaft fitting i just talked about putter fitting the biomechanic uh, the 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 uh kind of biomechanics of the golf swing and how those can help with design and club fitting and so you know he he but he's also a track and field coach he has tons of experience with fitness training and things of that nature his wife's a track and field coach and a pt that's kind of what they do up there in canada so I talked to him after that event. I think he was down here for a conference. I was like, man, I need to hit it further. And he was like, well, number one thing, we gotta get you a little bit stronger. So he, we, you know, I got, got on the deadlift protocol that he gave me, spreadsheet, all planned out perfectly. And I'd never even done that. You know, I was doing other training stuff, some kettlebell stuff and things of that nature. But I was like, okay, I'm in. And, uh, you know, I started doing that in my garage. I got my, my trap bar. And I started out with a couple 45s and boom, there I started. Then every time I needed to level up, I'd go to play it against sports and get some more plates. And, <laughs> you know, what do you know? There I was like, you know, three or four months later, I was like deadlifting like 400 pounds out of nowhere. And I was like, holy moly. Okay. Whoa. So that gave me 
some potential. I had some back, uh, my back was dicey, I think, you know, in my early 20s, the hernia discs, things of that nature. My back feels great now, like zero issues. So that's been super fun. I think that's a fun finding. But I kind of have that base, that base level of strength. And then it was like, okay, how do I get faster? Those are kind of two different things. I needed to have the strength and the base level strength there to, to make sure I, you know, felt good, had the potential for more, vert, more vertical force. So I kind of had that now in my system, so to speak. Then I needed to work on the technique and the speed training side. And he had dabbled with some research on speed training. And the thing with speed training, people have kind of done this in golf. They will do like gross level, what's called over speed and overload training, where they would go like super light, super heavy, nothing in between. And he, he knew from his research that you had to get much more precise with the speed training. You had to be very precise with the resistance levels, just like you would be when you're programming weightlifting, right? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of built that hardware uh, that turned out, ended up being the commercial product, which is now the stack system that allowed us to have very precise loads on the end and then cycle and build a training program and protocols around having that very precise loads. And that has absolutely been the secret to uh, both my speed gains and now that we've productized into the stack system. Uh, basically, when folks use the stack, you're you're literally getting Sasha McKenzie designing your protocols for you. Like it's all all of his brain kind of packed into the the algorithms in the app, which is super cool um, and been a lot of fun. So that turned my personal game around and helped me gain tons of speed and distance. I mean, I was. One, you know, I think for the golfers out there that kind of know ball speed, I was, I was in the one six. I I regressed into the one sixties ball speed range, which was low, on the PJ Tour. By the time I hit Beth Page in May of two thousand nineteen, I was playing golf with high one seventies ball speed. Wow, which means you're, you, which means I was up back to above kind of standard in terms of distance. And then I even dabbled with playing in the one eighties a little bit on the golf course. And now I'm trying to. You know kind of maintain those gains and things of that nature but it was an absolute game changer in a hundred percent the reason why i was able to a hit my driver further in that page but then the other benefit that people don't talk about is you hit your irons higher right and so that was able to land it steeper uh have a little bit more speed out in the rough and all the there's other ancillary benefits that come to more speed than just hitting your driver further yeah, I think that's what we we think of most is just the driver, just off the tee box. When you were playing with Luke, give us an idea, like how far behind a guy like him were you at that time in 2018? And what maybe would be his typical ball speed? Luke at the time was in the 190s ball speed. I think he's actually maybe tightened things up a little bit. I know he, he just won uh, on tour. And his I saw some of his ball speeds on TV that were a little bit less. Um, so he may have relaxed his speeds just a little bit, but he was literally like 50 or 60 yards by me. So he was in the 190s, and I was in the 160s. <laughs> and, and I would tee off, and I'd be like, okay, I'd like... And there was no, there was hardly any roll there, kind of Zoysia fairways, and it was when it rained that week and hot and humid uh, in the summertime. So I, my... Uh, we, we were kind of exaggerated by the conditions. If it were firmer conditions, I'd be rolling it out there a little bit more. But he was all carry to like 330, 340, and I'd be all carry out there to my like 280 or whatever it was at the time. I'm just going holy moly. But I, if I went back there with my speed today, I would have a way better chance of Bill Reed. When I look at the stack system, and I haven't had a chance to use it, but I, I have several clients that have used it. And the thing that I was blown away by is the intuitive, intuitiveness of, you know, you think of it's it's just uh, – a club that has some weights on it that you swing. Yeah. But really, I mean, the the biggest piece is the app and the algorithms. And like you said, it's yeah. it's basically Sasha McKenzie in your phone. So it's yep. not just a blanket program for everybody. It's based yep. on your performance, what you're doing. So give us a little insight into how that works. And I mean, obviously that had to take so much time and effort to put all that stuff together. Yeah, so we needed hardware that could do it. It's definitely a hardware software, you know, uh, combined holistic solution. We needed we needed hardware that gave you very fine spacing so we could change the loads, right? So the hardware has five weights, but when you do the combinatorics on how we laid out all the masses of those weights, it gives you 30 different combinations, right? 
it's to be like you're going into uh to 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 do curls or something and, you know if you didn't have all those weights you'd have like hands 50s and 100s i mean you, how are you going to progress <laughs> right you know through that through that range and so we need the hardware to do it and then so the hardware gives us very tight spacing and then you are absolutely right and the, the key is that everybody gets their own individualized programs so the first thing you do when you onboard to the stack app is you go through what's called a baseline session this is like your assessment and we have you swing your own driver you get warmed up do all that. We have you swing your own driver. Then we have you swing the stack with light, medium light, medium, medium heavy, heavy loads. And we generate, the app then generates what's called a force velocity curve. And based on that force velocity curve, it then uh, generates a customized program with specific training loads for you. And then what's cool about that is that, let's say you're going through your program and as you level up your speed, so if you start getting faster, the app looks at your previous workout and will generate adjustments, not only to just one six week program, that's not frozen and baked in time. It's constantly looks at your progress. It will start to level up with you as you go through it. So every workout is customized. Every single workout that you do is customized in the, in the app. Yeah, uh, and then once you get done with you know a training program, which is usually around six weeks, six seven eight weeks, um, you do a another equivalent of that baseline or assessment session, post uh, test, uh, post program uh, um, assessment, um, and then it compares how you've done. Are there any changes in your force velocity profile? And it will kind of ping the AI, which is getting like having Sasha's brain in there, and then we're training the algorithms with everyone who's doing it. Um, and formulate on your next program that will give you the highest probability to gain more speed. And the folks that have gained the most speed do it over two programs. So, you know, we, we folks gain a ton of speed in your first six weeks. The folks that go two programs gain a massive amount of speed, like 10 to 12 miles an hour in COVID speed. Holy cow. Unbelievable. We have, yeah. uh, so one of my friends and clients, so it, the podcast studio is also attached to a gym here. And so, uh, and we have a hitting bay out there. And uh, so one day I'm, I'm walking out and I hear, I just hear my buddy Andrew going 96. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm talking to the app. So, you know, yes. he had, had the little speed monitor. So you have to have the speed, I have to have a speed monitor to do this correctly. But it was cool because he's just, you know, he, he would record what it was and you don't have to go type things in. It's like, he just speaks it out loud. The app captures it, puts it in the spread. I mean, I was like, holy cow, this is, this is just amazing. So, yeah. so cool. Yeah. So that, that, that's, we call that kind of voice entry mode because, um, you know, eventually we'll, we'll probably have like a radar solution that Bluetooths through the app. But for now, you can just throw your radar down on the ground. You swing. And then, yeah, you just talk it in and you can turn on dictation mode and Siri and the app just captures it. And boom, you can train hands-free. And it's totally seamless. It has the timers in there. Uh, so it controls your rest times absolutely perfectly. And we continue to try to, what we continue to kind of refine those in the app. Uh, if you break a personal record, the app goes crazy for you. It'll start cheering for you. So we really drive a lot of the incentives in the app. And that is um, super fun is being able to do that part. Do you find that some people are almost a little intimidated when they hear speed training? And, you know, I mean, because I'm thinking of somebody like, yeah. obviously myself, but, you know, somebody like my dad, who's in his late 60s and yeah. is probably thinking, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I don't want to hurt myself. You know, what yeah. would you say to somebody that is kind of in that position and in that mindset where this might seem a little intimidating, might seem like too much to do? Um, what's your response to, to anybody with those questions? Yeah, no, it's good. I think especially for the, I think especially for folks that are that age, like they're a little bit older, like, hey, is it too late for me to gain speed or, you know, things of that nature? Um, well, on, on the intimidation side, I would say that, um, you know, it, it, speed training, if you're a golfer that wants to get better, is the lowest, gaining speed is the lowest hanging fruit, the lowest hanging fruit to lower your score. Like it, it is the it's the easiest thing to do with the stack like it's 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 just if you do just give us six weeks and, and you're going to gain speed and it's the it's the most correlated uh, uh skill to golf handicap 
like if you plot handicap and speed, uh, that's the most macro level correlated skill. So if you increase your speed, you're gonna lower your handicap. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, in terms of kind of the injury side or, oh, I might get hurt and things of that nature, you are way more probable to get hurt actually playing golf because the forces the forces that occur when you hit a golf ball or the ground or a root or a tough lie or things of that nature are an order of magnitude higher than anything you would experience with speed training. So you're much more likely to get hurt uh, playing golf, right, than you would be speed training. So that's kind of one thing. Obviously, you want to. We say that with uh, make sure you kind of uh, are, are in good physical condition. You don't have any underlying injuries and things of that nature. That's where the baseline strength level and everything that you guys do is super important because there's pairing there's pairing speed training together with your overall fitness training. Make sure you're in, you're in you're in good shape for both playing golf and quality of life off the golf course. Um, and and then I would say also that we have had some of our uh, best reviews from our stack customers are golfers that are 60 years of age and older. And we have, we actually have a good number of golfers in their eighties that are doing speed training and gaining speed and sending us notes over saying this, <laughs> this is a game changer. It's really fun. And they like the structure of how we have it. Like, I think that's one of the fun things. So one thing we've done, cause we have tons of, we, now we have a, close to 30,000 users that are doing the stack. And we charted, we charted age on the X axis and speed on the Y axis. And what you see is you see this peak in club end speed. This is just of all of our users, right? You see this peak around 40 years old of club end speed. And then after that, after you hit age 40 up to our 80, 90 year olds that are using it, you see this decline that's going down about one mile an hour per year. So if you are, over the age of 40, approximately, uh, gaining, like maintaining speed is actually gaining speed, right? That's another yeah. perspective to have on this for the older golfer, right? If you're maintaining, you're gaining on your on your peers. One of the things that we've been talking about a lot lately on the show is, is simply the fact that, you know, that whole crowd, and I would say even, you know, the 35 and 40 and beyond tend to just kind of neglect the need to move fast you know, and, and to keep that in your, just in your repertoire and whether that be speed training, whether that be doing some things in the gym that just get your body and, and utilizing, you know, all, all of our tissues tend to get a little tighter, a little stiffer, a yes. little less elastic. Yes. And it's, it's something that we can train. And obviously you guys are seeing this with the stack and I mean, up yes. into your eighties, you can make improvements yep. or, or at least really, you know, prevent any kind of, of loss there or, or most yeah. of the loss. So that's, that's just so refreshing to hear, especially because you have the science and the data behind it to show people like, Hey, once you hit 40, it's not over. Like you still put in the work and you can make significant, significant gains. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you can, yeah. we have, we have uh, stackers that have trained in their mid fifties, early sixties that have gained, maybe they've lost five miles an hour speed over the last decade. But now that they go with the stack, they do a couple of programs and they gain 10, and now they're faster than they've ever been in age 55 or 60. This is definitely possible. Um, the other thing I was gonna say, which I've personally changed my mind on, or I guess was an unintended consequence of the stack, is that there's a lot of value to swinging fast and training without the consequence of hitting the ball. Right, so I, I think a lot of golf coaches and teachers are very focused on, hey, I need to get to hit the center of the face uh, and things of that nature. There's plenty of time to work on that skill, you know, through technique and golf lessons. There's a lot of value to swinging an object fast with no consequence to hitting a golf ball. That was definitely something that I've had, I've really leaned into and enjoyed. And that a lot of our customers, I think, are enjoying about, um, you know, training with the staff. Technique was going to be my next question because I've had people say, well, I don't want to ingrain. If I'm already working on my swing, I don't have my technique down. I don't want to ingrain this improper swing and be swinging out of my shoes. How much do are, are you thinking about technique at all when you're swinging the stack or is it simply go as fast as you can? I think so. Uh, that's another thing. I work on my technique while I'm stacking. So let's say I have a, you know, 
some restriction my hip turn i want to get in more 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 side bends i want to uh increase my hand pound length i want to work on getting more spike the pressure in under my 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 lead foot more earlier in the transition to get more vertical force i will actually do those wall stacking and it's way easier to take that swing change again because i have no consequence of hitting the ball i'm working on movements I'm working on very like kind of internal focus of things. And then when you go play golf, those things are in, in, in hit a golf ball. Those changes are baked in more because I've trained them while training the stack. And one of the other things about speed training with the stack, it's like because you get feedback on your speeds, literally every single swing, it's maximum feedback. You get feedback on your speed speeds. Golfers can self explore what things are going to increase their speed, right? Let's say you're a golfer, you struggle with hip mobility, uh, and you're going to go in there, you're going to be like, I'm going to try lifting my lead heel. I'm going to do the step drill. I'm going to step with a right-handed golfer. You're going to take a little step with your left foot go in the transition of your swing. You can experiment with those things. I'm going to try a bigger shoulder turn. I'm going to let my head come back. I'm going to do all these things, a longer hand path. I'm gonna try some things with my wrist angles. I'm gonna try a faster backswing. And you can see immediately, does that spike your speed drop? So the instant continuous feedback to help drive your speeds is another great benefit in the stack. I just think people need to get over that worry that, oh, it's gonna ruin my tempo, it's gonna ruin my technique. You've seen Matt Fitzpatrick literally training on the stack and winning the US Open. Do you think it's worried about them or not? You know, Victor Hovland. He's got crazy on the stack. He's not, he's, he's driving it longer and straighter than ever. It's so, it's so fun to watch these guys these days. And I was talking to a, a PJ tour player the other day and he's like, man, I was, I was watching Fitzpatrick hit the ball the other day. And it's just, it's amazing to see from a Proof. year and a half ago or two years ago or whatever to now, and just how different it is and how, how much change he's made. It's, it's, it's That's, pretty special. I think what's fun about him is he's, he's, he's not a mega athlete. You know, he's, he's, he's not Brooks Kepka uh, out there all buff and ripped and doing all this stuff. He's in great shape, don't get me wrong, but he just looks like your average built person. He's somebody we could all relate to. Totally. All right, I got to ask you about the stack putting because, you know, we, we think the stack, we think speed, we think... But then I hear, no, there's a there's a stack putting now. And I'm <laughs> like, wait, more. <laughs> what? T tell me more. Tell me more. So uh, give us a lowdown on, on stack putting. I know we're, we're running a little low on time here. So we'll give kind of the uh, the short, brief version because we got some questions to ask you before we close up. But stack putting, where did this come from and and how's it doing? I think, yeah. So I think both Sasha and I, like, we're, we're, we're busy people like everyone else. Like, we got jobs, families, like, all this stuff. And a big theme for both of us is that what is the most effective use of time when I'm practicing or training? We don't want to waste time, right? So, we again, we wanted to productize this. People go to the putty green, and they have it's too open-ended. They have no idea what to do. They have no idea. You ask people, do they miss left? Do they miss right? People can't remember. If they do give you an answer, who knows if it's right or wrong? They have no stats to back it up. And so stack putting is like having Sasha <laughs> guide you to play 18 holes on the putting green. That is the most intentional practice of uh, 15 minutes on the putting green. It, the app guides you through playing 18 holes on the putting green. It tells you which putts to hit. And you're hitting the putts that matter the most from a strokes game putting perspective. That wow. means the putts that most to your, that mean the most to your score, the lower your score. And then it gives you really cool analytics to show you what your tendencies are, right? So you, it'll it could show you that you miss left or riders 90% of the time to the left, and without tracking it, you wouldn't you would have no idea. Like right. people don't don't know that information. So that actually the analytics in there, really cool spider diagrams and things of that nature are more advanced and more nuanced than even PJ Tour players get with shot link data. So yeah, it's super cool. Then you can create your own little programs in there with the creative mode. And then you can also track very detailed your on-course putting stats uh, as well. So yeah, if you're, if you're a stacker or a speed trainer, you get access to it or you can just download and and, uh, and do stack putting uh, uh, directly now. Very intentional, focused putting practice. Awesome. I, I love, there's a quote, 
Um, I'm th- trying to think who it was. I think it was Trent Werner, another um, PGA instructor that we work with, and he said, "Golf is the worst practice sport on the planet." And totally. what's so yes. cool is seeing things like this that are coming coming about to really help guide us. It, just like you were saying before, when designing clubs, if a designer doesn't have any kind of like walls or anything like any totally. kind of direction, like we can go anywhere and same thing with putting practice golf go to the driving range just like you can go spend hours and hours and hours and come back and not have achieved a a single thing that we're trying to change that man we're trying to do it so the stack the speed training it tells you exactly what to do when to do it send a calendar said swing it when the countdown timer goes off you can put reminders on your phone send them to your calendar and then putting is the same way do exactly this and um people love not that not having that open open endedness Awesome. All right, Marty, a couple questions just to finish up here with uh, with the 18 Strong crew. First of all, you Caddyshack or Happy Gilmore guy? I have to go Caddyshack uh, just because it's. I think it's going to stand the test of time better, you know. But I, I love them both. But I slight, slight tip of the needle to Caddyshack. If you get to pick a walk-up song, what's your walk-up song to the first tee box? I've been playing this song lately in my car before my tournaments, trying to get me pumped up. I don't even know how I found this thing, but it's by DJ Snake. He's like a, you know, EDM type artist or whatever called Bird Machine. Okay. And my nickname is my nickname is Journey Bird for yeah. Birdie, you know? And I'm like, I want to be a bird machine when I go out and play this tournament. So I'm, I don't know why. It's a strange one, but that's been getting me pumped up. I cannot wait to listen to that song. <laughs> All right. Is there a, a book that you've read in your past that has meant a lot to you, that you've learned a lot from, and that maybe you tend to recommend to people? Damn, I feel I have so many domains of life. Like I got my family life, my work life, my corporate life, my startup life, then my, my golf life, my fitness life. Uh, I kind of have a favorite in each category. Um, I'm in the golf world. I think I mentioned Every Shot Counts by Mark Brody. Yep. So from a golf domain perspective of my life, I like that one. Um, Give I me really one like more. Jocko. Yeah, I, I, I like Jocko Willink's, um, uh, I think, Extreme Ownership. I, I loved applying that to a, my personal life, my family, my kids, you know, how to empower people, build people up, um, and bring that into the working world. Uh, it's kind of a contemporary one i like the older books that stand the test of time more but i love the principles in that book excellent if you could pick a dream foursome who's who's your dream foursome that you get to play with anyone in the world past present um you can and you can take them anywhere you know what man i'm gonna say i'm living the dream because right now i'm playing i've been playing a lot of golf this summer with my wife and my two boys and my two boys my wife my two boys we got the perfect foursome and they're they're getting old enough to really like enjoy golf and just kind of move around the golf course. And I've actually, I've loved that more than anything, playing with my fam. That's so awesome. How old are the boys? They're seven and nine, almost 10. Great oh, age. Great ages. Great ages. All right. So follow up question to that. If you could take that foursome, we've got the 18 strong jet. We've got a fueled up, ready to go. Marty's taking the wife and the kiddos anywhere you want to go play golf. Where are you going to take them? It's hard not to say Augusta because how else are you going to get on that thing unless you're on the 18 strong jet <laughs> flying right in there? I've been there a few times, but man, that's the one that I mean, uh, you know, e- even people very connected in the golf industry never, never get a way to get on that thing. Augusta. Let's what's do it. Uh, what's the, uh, the, the coolest place that you have been able to get on? Uh, man, I've played some great courses over the years. You know, I think Oakmont was a great one. I mean, I played the old course with my wife and my father-in-law. I, I played there a, c- a couple times. Turnberry in Scotland. I've been play- been able to play some of the great Lynx courses um, in Scotland. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the old course is, the old course, quite frankly, is very tough to beat, you know, just for the, the whole history of it. And you know, being able to play that a few times has been awesome. Very cool. All right. Is there a social media account that you've been following, maybe geeking out on a little bit that you would recommend to the 18 strong crew? And this could be golf. This could be fitness. This could be anything. This could be the, the bird machine guys. <laughs> uh, there's one I really like. I really like what these guys do. It's called data golf. And um, they do, they, they have a lot of great analytics on their website. That's kind of, you know, free to use and explore. It's a great way to explore like 
applied statistics from the golf industry and they always run really cool little tidbits and nuggets uh, from golf tournaments around the world. So data golf, super fun to check it out. If you're either a golf, golf geek or general data geek, check them out. All right. Uh, I didn't prep you with this question. Just going to throw this one in there. If you got to play your home course and you're playing against our buddy Drew Sleazy Stoltz, how many shots is who beating who by? You get to pick the course. Man, Drew Drew plays, I got to say, Drew plays more golf than me, right? So that, I think we're going to be pretty tight, actually. I think I'm probably, at the most, if I were playing a lot of golf, I'd give him like one aside. But he's part of these amateurs here in Arizona that play more golf than the pros and, quite frankly, probably play better than the pros. <laughs> is there That'd a, be a tough one. Is there a transfusions handicap in there at all? Exactly. <laughs> Sleaze man's good, man. I tell you what, he, he needs, I think next year might be the year they get that four ball championship. That'd be sick. That would be sick. All right, man. Last thing. What's the best piece of golf advice that you've ever been given? Something that stuck with me a lot in, in I think has um, helped me in big tournaments and in general, even teach my kids is, is one very simple quote, which is move to relax. I think of golf, you, you kind of like, hey, even when you're putting, everyone's all in there frozen. You're like dead still and lighting up a thousand times. And then, you know, and then the anxiety builds and things of that nature. I've turned into being like a very kind of static player to moving a lot. I waggle, I move. When I putt, I tap my putter. I, you know, um, uh, kind of prime my nervous system before I try to hit a long drive. Like the waggle is very big. How you move before you swing. So I would say even when it's like short game stuff where you're trying to be oh, very precise in your putting, don't be afraid to move, waggle, jiggle, wiggle, move to relax. Very cool. All right, Marty, last thing, where's, where can everybody find you, find information about the stack? We'll link it all up in the show notes. Yeah, definitely thestacksystem.com. Check us out there. Social media, we got some really cool social media. You can see all of our stackers out there training, sharing their progress gain and speed and have a lot of fun. So join that community on the social side. Folks can find me primarily on Twitter, Twitter slash X now um, at at JertyBird, J-E-R-T-Y-B-I-R-D, hit me up. Uh, I'm so into kind of the whole trying to get better community and, uh, you know, you know, connecting the fitness side to the speed training side to the design, the performance. So fun to have some good, fun conversations there. Yeah, man, this was so good. And thank you so much for, for taking the time. It's really cool to see what, first of all, you guys are doing at Ping, obviously, but what you and Sasha were doing and really, you know, trying to bring bring us all to a better way of practicing, better skills, totally. and, and really kind of dialing everything in. So thanks for your time here, Marty. Yeah, you got a lot of fun to join, Jeff. Thanks for listening to the 18 Strong Podcast. Don't forget to go follow us over on Instagram at 18 Strong. And if you found this episode helpful and want to help us spread the 18 Strong mission, we'd really appreciate it if you shared with your friends. Train hard, practice smart, and play better golf.